Star Wars Disco doesn't get you in the mood for San Diego Comic Con. I'm not quite sure what will. Dena Geek is here. We're live in San Diego. Joining me right now is our managing editor, Mike Cicchini. And alongside him is our film critic, David Crow. And I'm your host, Chris Longo. And boys, we're back in San Diego. How does it feel? I love this town. I love this time of year. I haven't, uh, I haven't gotten tired of this yet. Ask me again on you know, Saturday night, Sunday morning, you might get a different answer. Right now, really excited, really thrilled to be here. Of course, San Diego right now is like a ghost town almost. The calm before the very, very nerdy storm. Of course, this is my first year, so I'm not really sure what to expect. We're going to have a good time, Chris. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of fun. He says that with a smile We're on. We're going to have so much fun. You, you may not remember it all, but you're going to have fun. So already outside of the San Diego Convention Center, people are lined up. What are they lined up for? They're lined up for Hall H. The thing is, is that the first Hall H event isn't until about 10 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday morning. And we are recording this on Tuesday night. So uh, anybody that is down waiting for Hall H right now is a particular diehard, and they're either waiting for The Hunger Games or Doctor Who, because we're pretty sure that they won't let you sleep in Hall H on Thursday night for any of the Friday panels, unless they've changed the rules. Maybe they just believe the odds are ever in their favor. Well, we could speculate all we want, or we could go down and talk to the people that are actually there. Around 10 o'clock last night, roughly 12 people were the Brave Souls camping out at Hall H, and Doctor Who fan Jason Kaus was officially the first person in line. I believe this is my fifth year. It's my Holy first Lord. year for Thursday, because normally the, the Doctor Who is the one I normally stay in line for, and that's norm that used to be on Sunday. So it was a little more manageable, because you could only line up so early. Yeah, but I've, I've been here every year since, so... Camping out on a grassy lawn isn't quite as glamorous as it seems, but sometimes there are surprises. You always get the people wandering through here. Uh, Stephen Moffat was in, wandered through here, possibly drunk, two years ago at like three in the morning. So. Kaus isn't alone. He's taking three-hour shifts with his girlfriend in hopes of making another Hall H memory. The first year I was at Comic-Con, I was getting some fresh air behind the convention center, and I see Matt Smith down on the, you know, the space that's the pier area that's, you know, on the way to the boat, separated. And, you know, I try to get his attention, and um, we talk for a minute, and I get, I get him to sign my fez. But, of course, he's across this, you know, small bit of water. So I have to toss him the fez and a pen. Nice. And he tosses it back to me. And that's, that's yeah, that's probably my favorite uh, overall, because that was really cool. I still regret never getting a picture with him, but... Sign Fez is still pretty cool. Not that we'll be camping out anytime soon, but we had to ask for some Hall H line survival tips. You know, just try to try to make friends with the people next to you in line. Uh, if you have to go somewhere, you know, the bathroom or whatever, they'll be the ones that can vouch for you when they come back. Uh, likewise, try to make friends with whatever the security person is that uh, that's uh, sticking around that night because they can be helpful too. It's, it's, you know, those things where it seems like, you know, if you have the patience for it, it's not actually that hard. It's sitting around and hanging out with other nerds, <laughs> um, which is, you know, fun. Uh, and remember that you actually can get pizza delivered to the line. So one panel that people are absolutely going to be lining up for, Princess Leia's, even Mark Hamill will be lining up for this one. We have Star Wars, it's Friday at 5.30 in Hall H, and there's plenty of news that's going to come out of there, but already some is trickling out. Today we got word that Phil Lord and Chris Miller are going to be very active in producing the Han Solo standalone film. Now, Mike, what can we expect from that? Well, it's supposed to be an origin story, so if you ever wanted to know why Han Solo is the uh, smart-ass space pirate that you met in uh, the first Star Wars film, I guess we're going to find out here. Um, that's really all they've told us so far. The problem is is that while these Star Wars spin-offs are known as the Star Wars anthologies, by any other name, they're still Star Wars prequels. 
What, you're telling me there have been other prequels about popular Star Wars characters and their origin and roots? No, we, we don't talk about those anymore. Why? Because it looks like we're about to do it all over again. <laughs> well, the good thing is, is that Han Solo is more of a known quantity than what we saw in the prequels. And uh, it really comes down to casting. Because I'm not sure how high the stakes can really be when you know where this character is going to end up at the end of the movie. Um, I would even go so far as to say the problem with a lot of prequels, especially with characters you love, is you want to see them already be the badass that is the reason you love them in the first place. For example, there was another origin film called X-Men Origins Wolverine, where we got to see how Logan became a the clawed for a anti-hero that everyone loves. Unfortunately, there, for two hours, he went by Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think we could end up finding out Han Solo's real name is Jimbo? I hope not. <laughs> I think Steve Solo has a nice ring to it. Maybe Bruce? How about Chris Pratt Solo? Because, ironically, of all the roles he's being uh, bandied around for in rumors and faux casting... This is one I actually think he'd be great in. I mean, hell, he's already played him in Guardians of the Galaxy. He's already uh, older than Harrison Ford was when he played the part in the first Star Wars movie. So uh, that's, something, that's something to keep in mind. I don't know how much, uh, how much younger they're looking to skew with, uh, with the character for this film. I hope they get a nine-year-old boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, they call him Little Honey. <laughs> Yeah, that didn't that didn't work out too well the last time. So, mock casting aside, there are some actual rumors coming out about Star Wars Rogue One, the anthology that's going to fill in the blanks uh, between the the new trilogy. So, December 2016, we're going to get that film. But one of the first big names that's coming out is Darth Vader. There's rumors that he's going to be showing up, or at least showing his hologram. If the rumors are to be believed, Vader will be in the film, but as a villain pulling strings from the side, much like uh, the Emperor was mentioned in the original films. So this will not be a continuation of Darth Vader as a central character, like in the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy, but perhaps it's a chance to do a Star Wars prequel with a cool version of Darth Vader. Well, one, one neat thing about the Star Wars anthology movies that have been announced so far and, and one that has been rumored is that while you know, the, the main films have always been about the legacy of the Jedi, you know, the, the, the disappearance of the Jedi from the universe and their, their return, uh, it looks like these new movies all kind of deal with the... Uh, underbelly of the Star Wars universe. So Star Wars Rogue One has been described as, as a war film. Uh, and of course then we're moving on to the Han Solo movie and there's rumors that the film that Josh Trank was involved with was intended to be a Boba Fett origin story. So it's, you know, soldiers, pirates, smugglers, bounty hunters, all characters that we know have existed in the wider Star Wars universe but have never really been explored in any uh, in any real detail on screen, like that's really been reserved for the Jedi and the broadest possible strokes of the battle between the Rebel Alliance and the Empire. You could say that the prequel trilogy, the original prequel trilogy, was focused on the Luke Skywalker Obi Wan Kenobi side of things. And even if Han Solo is only in one of these films, it sounds like that the next trilogy will be focused on the part that everyone loved from the original movies much more than Luke Skywalker. With that said, I have my own pitch for who should replace Josh Trank. I think that this is the perfect opportunity to have Mel Brooks <laughs> <laughs> take on the franchise and to use the t title that Disney really wants to call all these movies. Star Wars Anthology, The Search for More Money. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in all seriousness, Joe Johnston, the guy who directed Captain America, The First Avenger, uh, and, and who had a hand in, you know, designing Boba Fett, 
has been campaigning quite actively to make a Boba Fett movie for quite some time. And I believe at one point he was actually developing a Boba Fett movie with Lawrence Kasdan. So there is a chance, uh, you know, however, however slim it may be, that by the time they get around to that third film, if it is the Boba Fett origin story that has been, you know, kind of thrown around the internet for the last couple years, we might finally see him get a chance to direct his, uh, his Boba Fett movie. Well, if they continue giving directors wish lists, I do believe I recall Zack Snyder at one point said he wanted to do <laughs> a Seven Samurai version of uh, the Star Wars universe with Seven Jedi. Well, I like, I gotta say, I like that pitch an awful lot. I'm not really sure how Snyder's vision would, would fit with the Star Wars universe. Uh, I suspect that even though um, it looks like we've moved on from, you know, George Lucas crafted his prequel trilogy. He was very active in, you know, directing all three of them. And it looks like now Disney is moving back to the model that made the original trilogy a little cooler, which, you know, giving different, you know, a different chapter to different directors. Even the new core trilogy, episodes seven, eight, and nine, will be directed by, you know, by different people. So... I, I can't imagine that they would let somebody with as distinct a visual style as Zack Snyder meddle in the Star Wars universe, but I do like the idea of just like a straight up Seven Samurai homage in, uh, in the Star Wars realm. Might be better as a TV series though. I feel like that could be the motto for much of what's happening at Comic-Con these days. So today Disney did confirm that Lord and Miller will be directing um, but what else can we expect out of that Hall H panel? Because I know Star Wars is going to have a big presentation at D23. Uh, c- can we expect something big in the Boba Fett world? Is, is some, what's going to come out of this? I get the feeling that this Han Solo thing was probably the big announcement, unless they already have a Han Solo in mind that they're, that they're looking to trot out. Uh, they've already said there won't be any new footage from Episode Seven. Uh, Maybe they will reveal the title of the third anthology. Maybe they'll reveal the title of Star Wars Episode Eight. Uh, You know, they'll probably throw, you know, throw fans some more character details uh, about Episode Seven too. What what do you think the odds are? Well, maybe we'll see nothing new from uh, Episode Seven, but do you think we could see a teaser for Rogue One? I think it's. I think there's a there's pretty good odds of that. They they showed a. uh, They showed a teaser at the Star Wars celebration that never officially made its way onto the internet. And with, uh, you know, at the very least pre-production being much further along, and I imagine that, you know, uh, actors have been now shot in their costumes. The cast is mostly complete. They could probably put together a quick sizzle reel that looks looks pretty passable. Three prequel, terrible prequel movies made a mint off just the sound of Darth Vader breathing. I'm sure it'll still have the same effect in Hall H all these years later. I don't know if there's any way they could top that teaser for Episode Seven, because that yeah, was that, that last impressive. trailer was pretty amazing. Uh, that and was we, like people crying, impressive. Yeah, <laughs> that was pretty amazing. That that made me a believer again. It was good. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I should say something. I think we're getting to the point in. Uh, in the in the web publishing world, where we're gonna start giving out star ratings for teasers. <laughs> so, what, what was your star? If you said good, what's your star rating for the Star Wars Episode Seven teaser? As a teaser, it was incredibly impressive. As a piece of marketing, it's a five out of five. As telling me that I should want to see it, well, it really made me nostalgic for the original films, which after the prequel trilogy, I guess that is a. Uh, miracle and unto itself well I'm I am a little bit older than you and I might have more of an emotional attachment to Star Wars because of my childhood Uh, and that what we saw at Star Wars Celebration definitely gave me those kid at Christmas vibes that uh, you know that I haven't that I haven't gotten from marketing for most movies in recent years so you know they they certainly know their audience and if i'm if i'm their target audience they know how to pitch this stuff well not to get too much away from marketing and into quality i grew up with star wars the the original films were my favorite i used to 
I still think George Lucas is a genius. I know that's not popular to say anymore. What he was able to come up with was transcendent for cinema. For better or worse, those movies, along with what Spielberg did in the 1970s, changed film. And as a kid, I just loved them. Uh, in fact, I love them so much, it's one of the reasons I'm a bit apprehensive about where it's going. I think Episode Seven will probably be very good. Uh, but when you're releasing one a year, I mean, uh, I don't... The thing about the original Star Wars films is they had a beginning, middle, and end. They were a great piece of cinema history. They can't be great cinema if they're serialized. So it's maybe because of my love for growing up that I'm so uh, hesitant about what they're doing with it now. It's funny how the, the very scarcity of Star Wars for, for much of its existence is kind of what fed Star Wars mania. You know, for, for most people, all there ever were were three movies. And now three movies later... For many people, there are still only three movies. Well, but <laughs> three, three movies and a Star Wars Christmas. Yeah, well, that's a... Uh, but th there was, you know, e there was a time when even the, the comics and novels were not as uh, prolific as they, as they then became. You know, where you really had to... If you wanted more Star Wars, you had to seek it out. You had to go find the old West End Games, role-playing games books to... To find out the you know the lore and the backstory and the you know the relative power levels of the characters. So now I think we kind of take it for granted that Star Wars has been everywhere with comic books and novels, and some of those novels are quite good, and some of those comics have been quite good. The real test now is whether you know is whether these movies can be good when we're when we're guaranteed one a year, and we are now guaranteed a Star Wars movie a year for the next six years. That's, they'll be making Star Wars movies af long after we're all dead. <laughs> uh, I, I'll say that, I mean, but you talk about seeking out the majesty. The fact that it left the mind to wander, or to wonder, is why it is uh, so special to so many people. It was and is still this shining example of, uh, you know, a fairy tale. It's a modern day fairy tale. So it, when you continue finding out happily ever after, I'll put it this way. Uh, when Iron Man, which is nowhere near as good as Star Wars, I'm not saying this is an apples to apples one to one comparison, but when that movie came out, people really, really loved it because Robert Downey Jr. was so entertaining. I now think most people see Robert Downey Jr. in Adventures 2 and they shrug. And I don't hear anyone talking about how great the first Iron Man is anymore. Does this bring us back then to, uh, to the Han Solo movie? Because at the time when Robert Downey Jr. first put on the Iron Man armor, Tony Stark was pretty much an unknown quantity to, to the movie going public. And now he is this, you know, he is an iconic character just as surely as, you know, just as surely as Batman has been for the last couple decades. So now with Han Solo, you have probably the single most popular character in the history of a popular franchise with a performance that is just inescapably connected to one of the most popular actors of, of a generation. Is it easier to, to market a new movie with a new actor because of an audience's attachment to that character? Well, I think it'll depend a lot on Episode 7. If Episode 7 is good, and it should be, there so much is at stake for it to deliver, then I think you have introduced a whole new generation to Star Wars. I cannot take credit for this, but I read a funny com comment uh, somewhere that said, uh, right now, the grandparents are more excited about Star Wars than the grandchildren. But that is going to change as soon as Episode 7. Disney yeah. will do its job. Absolutely. Uh, and it will be a huge hit. Uh, in fact, it might be if Jurassic World's indication about nostalgia is anything. Uh, a Star Wars movie, which had a lot more good films in its franchise than Jurassic Park has... Uh, having December, January, and February essentially to itself for the most part. It's going to be ma mammoth. 
at that point, I don't think it really matters if some people are... It doesn't matter to the box office if some people are upset Harrison Ford's not there. And I will say there have been several very good movies made about Han Solo without Han Solo. Serenity, spun off from Firefly, is basically uh, Han Solo in a much more uh, uh, Western post-reconstruction story. And then, of course, Guardians of the Galaxy. So the question is not, can he be recast? It's, will it be good? But for the bottom line, it doesn't matter. Well, I think nostalgia only can take you so far. I mean, if it resonates with kids, I think that's going to bring this, breed new life into this franchise. Um, whereas, you know, with a Jurassic Park, yeah, it, it was a good movie, and a lot of people came back to it from, that were fans of it from the 90s. But if it resonates with the younger generation, that's what's going to propel it into being a new era for this franchise. And I think the same thing's going to happen with Han Solo um, and some of the Star Wars films. If, if it really clicks with kids and they're buying the action figures and they're buying the toys, I don't, I don't think it's going to matter if the older people are coming back to watch it. Exactly. I mean, uh, Jurassic Park is another film, I think, that's a masterpiece in popcorn entertainment. And it's so good that uh, parents and children were excited to see Jurassic World. And I think Jurassic World delivered. So, and it already has Chris Pratt on top of that, so they don't have to worry about casting rumors for the spinoffs. <laughs> but, uh, what we're saying is Chris Pratt should be in everything, and it will just make all of our lives a lot easier. I think Disney and Universal would agree with that. <laughs> Well, there's certainly going to be a lot of Star Wars news coming out of Comic-Con, and we'll be here, we'll be live. Please send us some tips at tips at denofgeek.us if you want to get social with us. You follow us at Den of Geek US on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Hell, you could even find this on YouTube, soundcloud.com backslash Den of Geek. And boys, yeah. let's have a good Comic-Con. All right. We'll catch you in a galaxy far, far away.